When 19-year-old Angela Jones from Adamstown Heights found out that she had been selected with nine other state representatives to tour Japan, she was excited to say the least. With all her fares and accommodation costs paid by a Japanese business company, Angela was nominated for the scheme by a local welfare organisation. I used to do volunteer work for the YWCA in Newcastle and I used to work with children with vacation centres and youth groups and they nominated me for this Youth Goodwill Cruise and Department of Youth and Community Services sifted through all the nominations from all the different community groups all over New South Wales and then they eventually chose 10 people and I was one of them. It involves the 10 of us flying out from here tonight. Uh, we spend a week in Tokyo, uh, we take a side trip to Kyoto and uh, then we cruise back on a ship with 500 Japanese students and that's like a cultural exchange type thing where we learn about Japanese culture while we're on the ship and uh, they learn from us about Australia. It's a unique program that you're going on. Is it one where you'll just be sightseeing? It's a lot of sightseeing, but not sightseeing as in tourist things, sightseeing as in educational things, like going to news agencies and um, printing offices, um, marine museums, uh, government offices, uh, that sort of thing. To share some Australiana around, Angela will be presenting her Japanese host with some handmade gifts. Set on 2,000 acres northwest of Musselbrook, the deer abattoir is on the property of Michael and Liz Scarp. There are now 200 deer farms throughout New South Wales, but the slaughter of the animal for a marketable commodity is a fairly new venture for the Australian rural industry. But it has the full support of both the State and Australian Deer Breeders Association, as well as the Minister for Primary Industry, John Kerrin. The minister officially opened the abattoir, saying that the deer industry will have a vital role in the future of Australian exports. It has a very high premium for its meat. Uh, we are importing about half a million dollars worth of meat. Uh, the demand for the imports is going up, and I think um, we have um, a taste here that needs to be met. And I'm sure there's going to be quite a lot of expansion and probably a, a lot of a potential for expansion to the ex export market itself eventually. The abattoir can cater for 100 slaughters per day. At present, it's running at one fifth production level. Next week, venison will be sold in selected supermarkets in packages like these. But at three times the cost of beef, the spokesman from the book of meats market to change from, say, beef on the dinner table to sales. venison. I think at this stage, the only problem is the cost of of the of the product itself, with our imports and not a whole lot of uh, deer being farmed in in Australia. Um, the cost is very high, but with the uh, help of the Deer Breeders Association, the increasing numbers of deer breeders now eventually will bring the cost back down. Colin Allied's $13.4 million net profit for the six months ending December compares with a $1.34 million loss for the corresponding period in 1984. Chief General Manager Bruce Thompson arrived in Newcastle yesterday and said the company regards the profit as only modest and just enough to allow vital capital investment. This is really the minimum level of profitability that we should be looking to if we're to stay in business. We've got to reinvest in our existing mines and we must be looking toward the development of new resources in the future. The profit could fuel mining union claims for bonus payments for increased productivity. The dispute, which sparked the recent week-long strike, is now before the Coal Industry Tribunal. Mr Thompson says Coal and Allied cannot afford to pass on its latest profits to employees. If we don't make profits, at least at this level, uh, I won't have a job in the future and neither will the mine worker. We must make profits to stay in business. If we were to turn our profit, uh, this relatively modest profit of $13.4 million with a company of the investments of the type we have, if we were to hand that out to all of our employees so that we had a zero profit, 
given another year or so, we'd simply be out of business and there'd be no jobs for anyone. The dinner at the Madison Motor Inn brought together 130 guests, including representatives of the sponsor Penfolds, the NJC, and invited members of the racing media from all over Australia. The media people were taking some special interest in the TAA Media Cup, which will be the second leg of today's double. But most of the talk was about the field for the first leg, the Classic itself. Local Philly hitter star should start favourite at 5-2. to two. Hyeda Prince 6-1s to ones, and Blazing Fontaine is looking like good value at 10-1. to one. Local racing writer Sam North was happy to give his tip last night. A guy like Hyeda Prince, the Warwick Farm uh, colt, I think it'll win from Top Avenger who is unraced but uh, very good reports about it from Sydney. And Blazing Fontaine, the Musselbrook filly from uh, the Pat Farrell stable, I think will run very well at big odds, or well not quite big odds, probably about 10 to 1 for the ladies in the third spot. Settling themselves in for the afternoon's racing despite the week. The track was getting heavier, raising the question whether favourite for the $50,000 Penfolds Classic against the star would be withdrawn. The plane that took back from early suggested. Two went back and also see the unraced fancy Avenger remain in the race. Yes, it's disappointing. Uh, let's hope it's only showers at this stage. Do you think it's going to stop a couple of runners from actually going in the race if this continues? Well, a lot depends on the next, say, two hours uh, and the time leading up to the race. Uh, the track can take quite a bit more rain as yet. We've given the track reading out as dead, and that's accurate, which means that uh, it's still got quite a bit of uh, take in it yet. Releasing the figures today, the director of the Hunter Valley Research Foundation, Dr Wedge Paradise, said these figures, combined with a drop from nearly 12% in November 1983, show a reassuring trend. Well, certainly it's a very encouraging trend, Ray, over the last year with uh, figures showing that there's over a 2% decline in the number of people unemployed throughout the Hunter region. Well, Dr. of course, uh, you've shown also provide that in a detailed the breakdown area of the Hunter the region labour force. Been... For example, the mining industry employed significantly more people, 16,500, compared with 11,500 12 months prior. And the number working in finance, property, and business services went up from 15,000 to more than 17,000 in the same period. Coal mining has uh, shown a significant increase in the number of people employed, as has the, the tertiary sector, which is following Australian and New South Wales trends. However, while unemployment fell generally between November 84 and 85, those aged between 15 and 19 without jobs increased by 1,000 in that same period. Youth unemployment continues to be a, a problem. The uh, 15 to 19 year olds have uh, had an increase in the number of people unemployed in the last year and this is uh, a concern for, uh, for us as far just, as... Just what sort of alarm bells does this fact ring? Well, what, uh, what we have to be uh, looking at is uh, uh, identifying policy initiatives to uh, try and provide opportunities for people in the 15 to 19 year old uh, groups. Females continue to make up only a small proportion of the full-time labour force at 27%, but form a high percentage, 80%, of the part-time labour force. And the unemployment rate for women in this region also continues to be marginally above that of men, 9.6 compared with 8.9%. While the Research Foundation points out that these and other details on hunter unemployment are obtained from a labour force survey undertaken by the Bureau of Statistics, and the figures should be regarded as estimates only, they are useful in identifying important trends.
miniature city that is the Newcastle showground came alive yesterday, the culmination of days of setting up and 12 months of careful planning. There will be all the features we've come to know and love, the flurry of Sideshow Alley and exhibits on just about everything that is manufactured, grown or sold in the region. Many of the displays have a strong educational theme and the State Rail Authority's impressive display is a good example of what you can expect. There will be more free entertainment in Centre Ring than ever before, including trick horse displays, skydiving and Roman chariot races. On the agricultural side, show organisers have received record entries for the cattle and horse judging. Perhaps the biggest change is the increased emphasis on the region's industry. The industrial show has never been really strong. Happened the last two or three years and started to improve. I think, I think this, this year it'll 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 culminate a lot of hard work in uh, bringing the industry side of the show up. And According the agricultural Jim, the and horticultural side still very strong. Together. Yes, we've always been fairly strong. Our main purpose really is to uh, show the city people what goes on in the country, uh, let them see the problems perhaps the country guy has, and also let them see that uh, a piece of steak doesn't really come from a butcher shop. The gates open at 11 this morning and you'll have until Sunday night to experience the excitement of the show. Blythe Spirits now, is typical of the kind of dry upper class fast Mark Howard delighted in writing. First staged in London oh, okay. in 1941 and set in the 1930s, the comedy tells the story of a seance which materialises the spirit of Charles Condamine's first wife, Elvira, much to the dismay of his second wife, Ruth. Two wives in one household don't add up to domestic bliss. The NDAC's production is directed by Margaret Tupper and stars Anne Frost as the vampish Elvira. Anne was nominated for the Best Supporting Actress, Conda, for her performance in Chicago last year. The difficult part of Madame Arcati, the medium who creates the problem, is played by Daphne Flanagan. Blythe Spirits opens tonight and plays every Wednesday, Friday and Saturday night until the 15th of March. Oh, we've drawn a blank. Think again. Rack your brains. Think of somebody. It must be somebody else. Think. She can't be on Mrs. I'll let you know. She died on Wednesday. The tanker was carrying the diluted acid to Stockton Borehole when it left Lake Road Glendale and later turned on the parallel Stephen Street at around 8.30 this morning. Only a small amount of its load and some diesel leaked onto the road. Firemen looked on as the liquid was transferred to another unit but said there were no problems. The driver was taken to hospital with minor injuries. Despite the heavy rain over the past few days, the show committee says that today's sunshine will allow the ground to dry out and it will be in perfect condition. According to organisers, this year's show is set to be a big one. A crowd of more than 150,000 is expected over the five days and already people are waiting for the gates to open and the entertainment to begin at one o'clock. Yes, Head of the School done. of Nursing and Health Studies, Don Andrell, says more than 200 pregnant women are needed for the program well, so that the students can observe on a one-to-one -one basis the process of pregnancy. We want uh, to gain some awareness, um, to have the students fully aware as to what this very important social event means to the mother-to-be, the father and to any siblings that already exist within the family. It's just part of the wide understanding of health and health problems that uh, relate to the population that the nurses 
a survey. Now this is the first time this has been tried. Do you think you'll have any problems finding these women? I think mechanically um, we could have a few problems and this is why we're asking women to contact us if they are willing to allow the nursing students to participate with them in the event, not just the actual birth of the baby, but the build up to that time period and then post the event. Stephen Legg, son of Alan Legg, driver of ACE, the current series leader in the unblown hydro class, is one of a number of locals involved in Sunday's well round Sunday. six. Yes, um, all the drivers look upon this second last round as a lead up to the Grand Nationals at Windsor and uh, just a trial for their boats and it always uh, counts towards the point score which is very important at the end of the day. As usual, we have some very spectacular competitors uh, coming to Rain and Terrace. Yes, there's um, three boats who are probably the fastest in Australia at the moment. They're Kyle Runner, driven by Russell Mills. Um, he, his uh, top speed this year was 171 mile an hour. And there's also Fallacy, a new boat to the water that's driven by Stan Saney, who uh, come close to winning last year. And there's also the debut of Outrage. Uh, the winner last year, and that's driven by local boy Len Gossman. Well, you're part of the leg team, which is obviously leading their own class with one round to go, and your father's just come out of hospital. Do you think you're going to be able to uh, front up on Sunday? Uh, yeah, we hope so. We are leading the point score at the moment, and it's very close in the unblown hydros, and we hope we'll be able to show and put on a good race. <laughs> 